Hello viewers, welcome to Newsweek South Asia, a program that talks about breeding of terrorism and its impact on South Asian nations. Let's begin with the headlines first. Persecution of Ahmadiyya Muslims continues in Pakistan. US says the memories of the Mumbai terror attacks are still vivid both in India and the United States. And Taliban deprived women of livelihoods and identity. Let's begin the show with Pakistan, where there has been yet another instance of hatred against Ahmadiyya Muslims in the country. A video has gone viral on the social media wherein a group of Islamists are seen vandalizing one Ahmadi mosque located in the southern area in Karachi. Mob violence and killings against the Ahmadiyya community have become increasingly common in Pakistan. Ahmadis in Pakistan represent a persecuted minority and the exclusion of Ahmadis is even enshrined in the constitution of Pakistan. A video has gone viral on social media, wherein a group of Islamists are seen vandalizing one Ahmadi mosque located in the southern area in Karachi, Pakistan. In the video of the incident, it can be seen that three masked men are standing atop the structure and smashing the tomb and the minarets with hammers. A large crowd has assembled to watch the men vandalizing the structure. Towards the end of the video, a man can be seen trying to desecrate the kalima inscribed on it. As per local media, the attackers were from Pakistan's Islamic political party, tehreek e labbaik Pakistan. According to locals, police officials were there when the event took place, yet they did nothing to stop the miscreants from damaging the Ahmadi place of worship. This is the fifth mosque of the Ahmadiyya sect to be desecrated in Pakistan. The hatred for Ahmadis is particularly severe. Because remember, they are not just seen as kafirs. Kafirs are still fine. But the Ahmadis are seen as heretics within the religion because of their belief systems, right? So the fact that uh, uh, their uh, minaret was destroyed is nothing new. Uh, a lot of their places of worship have been desecrated. Even their burial grounds have not been spared and have been desecrated in the past. So, you know, it's, um, it is chronic, it is all pervasive, it is endemic in Pakistani society going after Ahmadis. And there's a whole system that's developed that normalizes this kind of behavior. Ahmadis in Pakistan represent a persecuted minority and the exclusion of Ahmadis is even enshrined in the constitution of Pakistan. Ahmadis have also been excluded from the Pakistani government's minority commission aimed at safeguarding the rights of the country's minorities. As estimated, 4 million Ahmadis face severe abuse and discrimination along with other minority communities like Hindus, Sikhs and Christians. Ever since Tehreek e Taliban ended a ceasefire with the government in Islamabad last year, terrorist attacks have intensified across Pakistan. The TTP has obviously become emboldened by the Taliban's capture of power in Afghanistan. The scenario has helped them to unleash fresh violence against the minorities in Pakistan. According to various sources, there was a time when minorities constituted nearly 15% of the population in the main cities. Now they make up less than 4%. Pakistan was made for the Muslims of India, right? They've been very clear about that doctrine and they've been very clear about, you know, uh, Islamizing or getting rid of the minorities uh, across Pakistan. So this is not, uh, this is what their nationhood was based on. So it's obviously going to be, uh, you know, if, if that is your foundational myth, they will do everything to uh, ensure that it happens. What is not helped of course is the fact that you constantly have this uh, you know financial troubles geopolitical troubles troubles of some kind or the other where you know in order to divert attention uh, from the real problems you will obviously find minorities to blame for it and go after them 
Violence in the name of religion is dangerously rampant in Pakistan. The in-depth roots of religious extremism are turning the entire inhabitants of the country into religious zealots. The ruling class, whether military or civil, has exploited religion to give legitimacy and popularity to its regime, instead of curbing the menace of fundamentalism. Fundamentalism, extremism and terrorism have grown so much that now it has become difficult for the Pakistani government to control this menace, which wants to take the society to pre-Islamic days. Moving on. In one of the most horrific terrorist attacks in India's history, 166 people were killed and over 300 injured as 10 heavily armed terrorists from Pakistan created mayhem in Mumbai on November 26, 2008. Recently, the Biden administration has stated that memories of the brutal attack by terrorists in Mumbai are still vivid both in India and the United States. A report. On 26 November 2008, one of the deadliest terror attacks were carried out on Indian soil that led to the deaths of 166 people in Mumbai, including foreign nationals, while leaving 300 others injured. The attacks were carried out by 10 lashkar e taiba terrorists who sailed into Mumbai from the Pakistani port of Karachi. The attacks lasted for three days. Nine Pakistani terrorists were killed by the Indian security forces. Ajmal Kasab was the only terrorist who was captured alive. He was hanged four years later on November 21, 2012, after a trial. The Biden administration has stated the memories of the brutal attack by terrorists in Mumbai in 2008 are still vivid both in India and the United States. The terrorist attacks uh, that, uh, that took place uh, in uh, uh, 2009 in Mumbai uh, of course, the memories of that are still vivid. They are still vivid here in India. Uh, they are still vivid uh, in the United States as well. Uh, we can all remember the horrific imagery uh, of that day, the assault on the hotel, the bloodshed uh, that resulted. Uh, and it's why we've continued to insist on accountability for uh, the perpetrators of this, not only the individual operatives uh, who took so many innocent lives that day, uh, but uh, the terrorist groups that uh, were behind this, that uh, helped to orchestrate it as well. The seeds of Pakistan's tries with terror actually were sown after Pakistan's debacle in 1971 war. Pakistan got divided. East Pakistan became Bangladesh. Since then, Pakistani leadership, led by Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, had pledged to bleed India with thousand cuts. It sensed the opportunity to do so during the height of the Cold War when the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan. With the government's knowledge and the military support, terrorists continue to operate and raise funds inside Pakistani territory. There are several kinds of terror groups operating in and from Pakistan that can be distinguished by their sectarian background and their areas of operation. Their objectives may vary from overthrowing the Pakistani government, orchestrating attacks on Indian soil or support of Afghan Taliban. However, the seeds of terrorism sought by Pakistan to target neighbouring countries have returned to haunt it. Terrorist groups have grown so powerful that they are now nominating their own shadow government, openly challenging the state. This weakening security in Maman comes when Islamabad faces an economic meltdown amidst political turmoil. Pakistan has exhausted all its funds that it received as foreign aid for the war on terror led by the US by funding terror groups against India. It is a debt-ridden economy. The world sees Pakistan as the epicenter of terrorism and Islamabad should clean up its act and try to be a good neighbour. Pakistan's primacy in the international narcotics trade and the funding of terrorist activities has been time and again confirmed by several investigation agencies worldwide. There are clear indications that Pakistan-based narco-terrorist networks have stepped up their activities on the Indo-Pakistan international border. 
the seizure of huge quantities of heroin from Pakistani drug peddlers have shown how narco terror has become a major concern for the law enforcing agencies in India. We have a report. Narco terrorism is an integral component of Pakistan's state sponsorship of cross border terrorism, used so as to fund and conduct asymmetric warfare against its neighbors. Over 80% of drugs in India are infiltrating from neighboring Pakistan. The country's intelligence agencies have been working with terror groups on a kill two birds with one stone strategy to smuggle weapons and narcotics into India through the same routes. Islamabad has been heavily relying on the sale of drugs in Kashmir to fund its terror infrastructure. Recently, at an investiture ceremony in Srinagar, Lieutenant General Upendra Duvedi slammed the neighboring country and said that a dual strategy of sending across drugs as well as weapons through drones is being employed to keep the fire burning in an attempt to disrupt the social fabric. Pakistan having failed miserably in its proxy war through terrorism in Jammu and Kashmir has recently launched another form of hybrid terrorism in Jammu and Kashmir and that is through the sale of drugs. This is called as narco-terrorism. However, it is not a major cause of worry for the Indian government as the government of India has taken adequate steps to control this kind of proxy war. It is a matter of time before this evil design too of Pakistan shall be defeated. Last year, the National Investigation Agency arrested Abdul Rauf Badan for his involvement in the supply of narcotics, cash, arms and ammunition through the LOC border in Amruhi area by concealing the consignment in a vegetable carrier vehicle. Also, NIA filed a charge sheet against a total of 11 terrorists in connection with deep-rooted conspiracy for procuring and selling narcotics drugs and generating funds in Jammu and Kashmir and other parts of India in closed association with operatives of park back terror organizations Lashkar and Hezbollah Mujahideen. Drug trafficking across borders gives terrorism financial support and if it is not stopped immediately, could damage the lives of the region's children. The finances generated from drugs such as heroin fund separatist activities and spread other centrifugal tendencies. Increasingly, terror modules that have been busted in the recent past by security agencies show a most significant challenge to society and security. To put an end to Pakistan's narco-terrorism in Jammu and Kashmir, the Indian government should take three measures. Firstly, there should be fast-track courts to try the people who have been caught in this act. Secondly, the youth of Jammu and Kashmir should be educated about the ills of narcotics through articles in the print media and programs, in the electronic media and the social media. And thirdly, the government of India should raise this issue in every possible international forum. The nexus between drug traffickers, criminal networks and terrorists are potent threats. Exploitation of the trafficking routes by terrorists with the help of well-entrenched criminal networks to infiltrate with arms and explosives have added a critical dimension to the security of the borders. Moreover, large-scale availability of narcotics and drugs encourages demand for narcotics and drugs by the domestic population, consumption of which produces dysfunctional behavior, thereby creating law and order problems in the society. Therefore, India needs to adopt a comprehensive approach to tackle this challenge. Taliban rule has had a devastating impact on Afghan women. 
The Taliban have imposed rights violating policies that have created huge barriers to women's and girls' health and education. Many Afghan women don't just want to work, they need to, as they are the sole breadwinners in their family. Unemployment and decades of war have left Afghanistan with hundreds of thousands of widows. Our report. Afghan female prosecutors who fled their country now feel safe in foreign countries after being granted asylum. Former Executive Secretary to the Deputy Director of the Office for the Elimination of Violence Against Women, Shamail Husnia, recently relocated to Spain. Like many of her colleagues, her situation in Pakistan without official refugee status was in a legal limbo after the Taliban returned to power. She is secure in Spain, but she is worried about her family and friends in Afghanistan. احساس داریم احساس خوبی داریم یعنی حس میکنیم که در همیت هستیم از شان خیلی ممنون از هم ما خانواده ما ماندن از اونا صرف تا نیستن که تا پاکستان بیاین حالا می احساس از زیر درد ترس داریم که پاکستان اونا رو دوباره روان نکنن باز اونا باز افغانستان برن معلوم دار هستن بخاطر که اونا رو زنده نمیمونن when a government that upholds a strict interpretation of Islam came into power in a home country in 2021, women's freedoms there were abruptly restricted. Most female aid workers are prohibited by the Taliban government, which also forbade girls and women from enrolling in high school and universities last year. One of the 19 female prosecutors who have obtained asylum in Spain is Obeda Sharar. While she was living in Afghanistan, her work and the work of her female peers was hazardous. As female prosecutors oversaw the trial and conviction of men accused of gender crimes, such as rape and murder, they came under threat and became the target of retaliation attacks. توقعی ما خواست ما از اتحادیه اروپا و تمام سازمان های بین ای است که ما را با ای گروه تروریستی تنها نمانند و چشم گوششان را بر روی ما بسته نکنند. ما از کشوری آمدیم که کسایی که ماین می گذارند در جاده ها و خانواده ای اونایی که حملات انتحاری انجام دادن تقدیر می شوند در رسانه و در دیدی مردم. The recent Taliban ban on women working in international and national organizations and women moving about public spaces has also affected women being able to find employment. Previously, about 10% of educated women in Afghanistan worked in national or international organizations to support their children. If less educated, they had a range of formal and informal jobs, including working as housemates, baking bread, washing clothes, cleaning bathrooms and babysitting, and in rural communities, rearing small livestock and growing wheat, maize and vegetables. Single women and widows have practically no way of earning money. On the Ground report reveals that many households are supported by women as male members of their family were either killed or injured in the ongoing conflict. It's difficult to estimate how long local communities, themselves striving to survive, can keep women-led households and their families alive. And with that, we come to the end of this edition of Newsweek South Asia. We'll be back next week with more news, views and analysis from the subcontinent. Meanwhile, do keep writing to us at nwsa at anin.com. This is Shivangi Mishra signing off on the behalf of the entire production team of Newsweek South Asia. Goodbye and take care.